Welcome to the Sport Exchange with me, John Robbie. Hi guys, welcome to the Sport Exchange podcast where we meet sporting personalities and learn about their lives and their life stories. Today, the Sport Exchange podcast welcomes a household name in cricket. He's a regular on our screens and a man with a very interesting career, wonderful average as a fast bowler in tests and a shocking one in ODIs and also with the bat. Welcome, Pumalelo Pommy Mbangwa. Pommy, thanks for coming in. Morning. <laughs> Morning, John. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's a great welcome. Before, <laughs> let me start off by saying I played nine tests for Ireland and lost nine. Okay, so my mm. record is not the greatest. <laughs> so in a funny sort of a way, I think we both look back on our careers maybe and have a bit of a chuckle. Yeah, I, I do have a chuckle. I, I suppose um, for those who would know um, the... The pitfalls, the difficulties of um, international cricket or international sport and those you play against and with will kind of chuckle at stuff like that every now and again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I, I look back on it all and, and there's absolutely no regret with regard to results and, and kind of how you went. It just is, you know, nothing you can do about the past and nothing you can do um, to sort of, if I went back and tried to look at my cricket career and say, well, what could I do differently with regard to the results that you're talking about? Yeah. Maybe I could have practiced batting a little bit more. But, <laughs> <laughs> but and, such and, a and life. And yet you got, a, you got a century in school, didn't you? In, yeah, in, well, in, in school, I suppose things come quite easily some of the time. You know, yeah. you, you kind of do what you do. And um, with batting, it was just a hit and giggle. It was fun. And if I could hit it as far as possible, that's what I'd do in school. And <laughs> and uh, a couple of times it come off and you get 100. But bowling right from the start is kind of what tickled my fancy and that's what I tried to become good at yeah. and and so worked on that from the beginning and the natural progression got in that way into the side and and I suppose back then um, I remember John Hampshire who was um, Zimbabwe's coach um, at famous the time. batsman yeah yeah Yorkshire he's, yeah, that's he's from, right. from Yorkshire kind of played with Jeff Boycott and, hey. and that, yeah. yeah that 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 era um, yeah it's quite good and and he said all you need to do is bring your boots to practice. <laughs> That's it. So, so, so it kind of set it out that way, you know. That could be a lovely name for a book. All you need to do is, is bring your books. Can we clear up the name? Pommy, is that because people didn't maybe in the old days of Zimbabwe pronounce African names in cricket? Or was it because of your experience going to an English school and coming back with a Pommy accent? Where did Pommy come from? So I think it's... It's um, all of those things. Mm. Um, it's uh, at the start. I, I got the name Pom P O M um, when I was thirteen, going on fourteen, and it was national trials. Um, a guy I played with who's still I'm still in touch with, Gavin Rennie, mm. um, played at the same time, same age, and he, when we were national under fifteens, um, said. You know, oh, yeah, when we we'll know these trials, oh, what's your name? Yeah, my name is Gavin. What's yours? My name is Mpumelelo. Goodness, say that again. <laughs> you know, my name is Mpumelelo. Oh, and he tried and he tried and uh, pom, pom, and it kind of stopped there. Yeah. And he tried a few times and they said, can I, please, can I just say pom? Is that fine? And, and I didn't care one way or another, yeah, actually. Yeah. It didn't matter to me. It was just, you know, whatever. But you carry on. And so that's what he'd say. And very quickly, without resistance or acceptance or whatever it was, it caught on yeah. with the guys. So that's with 15 guys who are 14 years old, plus the coaches that were there. And this was the first kind of representative side that was of any note. Because mm. I remember we went to Namibia. Uh, we went to Namibia on a tour as all 15 of us. Um, and... That just carried on. So when anyone was asked who was of authority within that side, coaches and so forth, you know, how these guys who you've taken on this tour, they'd say, oh, there's this bloke called Gavin Ring. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's this bloke called um, uh, Madondo. There's this bloke called uh, Pom. Yeah. <laughs> so that, today, many would actually, in, in, in the current climate, certainly in South Africa and probably in Zim, it might be seen to be very patronizing that somebody wouldn't use. Would, would you have been as accepting of it today if it was the same situation to a young kid, do you think? 
No, I don't think so. I, I don't think it would have passed. Yeah, yeah because, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, different times. So yeah, I mean, you were talking about quite a while ago. So, sure. Yeah, so um, a different time, and in this day and age, there is the insistence, isn't there? Uh, my name's Mpumele. Absolutely. Yeah. Will, you will learn it, mm. and you will say it, mm. and and that's kind of what happens. And I must add, whilst there are some who are resistant to trying mm. to say names. But many and most will try very hard and will get it, you know, mm. just just because a, you do. A, in the a end. small victory. Let's call it a small yeah. victory. <laughs> yeah. how, why did you retire at 26 and how did you get into, into commentary? <laughs> oh, uh, the reason I'm asking is because we're going to go through your career now, but then I'll, I'll never leave enough time to get into the room because your, 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 your rise in the world of commentary has been phenomenal for somebody with dare I say it, a modest record. Mm. When you're dealing with the Bothams and the, mm. uh, you know, the, 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 the um, um, superstars of the game, etc. So tell us about retirement, funny place to start, and then how you got into your current career. Yeah, I, can, can I say that I'm, I'm still not retired? From cricket? Uh, yeah, never retired. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, there was no occasion that turned out, okay. that's it. Ah, oh, that, you know, that Mbangwa kid, he's decided he's going to retire now. I didn't, didn't really happen that way. Yeah. Um, How did it happen? It, I suppose I have to call it, you know, kind of God's way in, in yeah. essence, because I was on this path and you're, you're young. All you ever want to do is play cricket for your country. You want to be a professional cricketer um, and you get there. And when you get there, I mean, I learned very quickly when I got there that, oh, hold on, this is a whole different level mm. to anything that you could have ever dreamt of, you know. And so, okay, the quest is to be better and better and better all the time. And and whilst it's happening, it's like this dream. You live this dream every day, every, um, every tour you go on. And um, the hard part to deal with for me was you. I wasn't in the 11 all the time. Mm. And, and so that kind of from a psychological perspective was something that was difficult to deal with and and you know you've got to keep yourself up you've got to say when I'm in I'm going to be as good as can be sort of thing and so that was a bit of a challenge Mm. and then as quickly as it kind of started so picked at 1920 go on a tour kind of tour around the world, go here, there, everywhere, play a few games here and there, do decently here and beat there. Beat India, beat Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. You know, so do decent stuff uh, and, and kind of there's always this promise, but it never shifts on. At, and I can't remember if it was 26, the last game I played, I think, was in 2002, right? So, and it was in the Champions Trophy. And then 2003 was the Cricket World Cup in South Africa. And turned, returned from Sri Lanka, Champions Trophy, and a squad of 30 was put together for, you know, training for the World Cup. And my name wasn't there. Oops. And I said, what, what's that about? Like, you know, yeah, so yeah. find the answers, try and find them, nothing. But kind of carry on, you know. And I, But kind of be a little bit despondent. I mm. don't understand what's going on. And you never can get enough answers or the right answers. It's just... You know, select every selector and, tells yeah, you it wasn't me. I voted for you. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and and so to go from being in an eleven that plays to not being in a thirty that trains kind of hit me quite hard. And, and so yeah, and at the time the atmosphere within kind of cricket and mm. what was going on wasn't particularly great. But in the year before that, I think it's two thousand and one, and I think it was the West Indies who were in. Um, in Zimbabwe, I'd been asked to just help out with, you know, comments, sitting ah. next to uh, guys who were commentating. So I'd go, I went into the commentary booth and sat there because I wasn't, I was in the squad, yeah. but I wasn't yeah. in the 11. And I remember kind of sitting there being m- m- interviewed. M- maybe it was to help pronounce the names. <laughs> as, as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, so sitting there talking to guys and just answering and, and someone came to me and said, oh, you... You should do. You should do this. this mm. You know, I said, sh- I said, shut up. Do what? What do you guys do? This stuff is despicable. You guys all think you know everything. You know, you're busy telling us how rubbish we are and blah 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 yeah, blah blah. Yeah. I said, nah. You should. Do, this is you. You can do this when you're done playing. This is what you're gonna. No chance. I said, there's no way. I wouldn't actually want to do it. I'm just helping you guys yeah. here, right? 2001. 
2003, fast forward, but there's, and there were a couple of times that next year, the next year in 2002 before the Champions Trophy and so forth, another tour on. Yeah. And I go help out again, you know, play a couple of games and out of the side or get injured or whatever, help out again. 2003, I get a call to say, hey, um, John Gaylord, his director, and there's a guy called Tony Still who... Um, I think they both worked for Octagon at the time. Mm. Yeah. Um, not trying to punt Octagon. Anyway. No, it's all right. Fun to win. Yeah. Um, but they said, hey, look, we'd like you to be part of the commentary team. There'll be uh, games here in, in Zimbabwe and there'll be games in South Africa for the 2003 Cricket World Cup. Will, will you work on, on that? I said, if I'm not in your squad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still holding out. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, they, they yeah. made a great big mistake. I played the last games and played, so I don't know what you're on about. So I'm going to be in the squad. I said, um, okay, if you're not, will you? <laughs> I said, sure, I Diplomacy will. personified, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said, sure, I will, no problem. And so um, I wasn't, and I was. I did the commentary, so I did some in Zimbabwe and did some in South Africa. A few games here and there. 2003 World Cup went away, done. 2000, uh, straight after the World Cup, there was some quadrangular in uh, Dubai. Again, I got a call and Zim's team was going there. And instead of people, it was quite weird. I find it quite weird because mm. instead of people kind of looking at me and saying, you know, this cricketer from Zimbabwe, they started almost pretty much right then. 2003, 2004. Oh, there's that guy, that commentator. Commentator from Zimbabwe, yeah. No, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, that's not what I do. I play cricket. I run up and bowl. That's kind of what I do. That's, that's you know, that's what I want to do anyway. Had to go and do this quadrangular. Was asked to do it. Went there, did it. No hassle. Came back. I still play 2003, 2004. But in my head kind of things started jumping yeah, in there, yeah. you know. And I I found, um, having thought it was despicable before, over time and getting to learn what happens just to get the broadcast yeah. out, I found I absolutely loved it. I was so fascinated. I'm still fascinated today, John, how it like comes together. It's unbelievable. So I, I then... Do you mean the then, technical side, the, the behind the scenes, the, the whole, crew, everything, yeah. and then the director there in your ears, in the box? So the size so, of the operation. Yeah. yeah. So so just just the fact that when you're at home, you see this picture. Yeah. And you see this bloke talking, or you hear this, you know, you hear this bloke talking, and you see kind of the cricket, the rugby, the football, whatever it is, and it seems so simple, right? Yeah. yeah. And then if you just kind of take a layer back, you know, so go from the guy you're looking at and go, why can I hear him? Yeah. And, yeah. You, you know, can speak to a sound technician and why can I see him? You know, the right shot from the cameraman and go all the way back to director, to engineer, to what it just fascinated me. That's, and, and that's it. And, and then if you kind of took what cricket did, because it still does. I'm still so excited mm. about the sport, watching things unfold and so forth. And you put those together, it just kind of kind of match made in heaven for me. And I'm sort of thinking, oh, hold on. I might not have really dreamt about it, but I'm kind of living <laughs> another dream here. <laughs> Do you know? And, how, how, how does it actually work? I mean, in the same way as you have... Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you. I, in the same way as you've got like club cricket and then you go provincial cricket and then international cricket and then IPL, you know where they are and the relative um, seniority of it. Mm. How does it work in commentating? Because... We don't know if it's Sky, if it's Octagon, if it's Super Sport, if it's IPL, etc. Mm -hmm. How does it work? Are you a freelancer who gets called by different organizations or are you contracted to somebody? Give us an idea of the overall arrangement. So they're territories. Mm. So um, Super Sport, who mm. I work for in South Africa, kind of will buy the rights for a territory. So for South Africa, when it comes to international mm. cricket, Super Sport have the rights. But they also have the rights for sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Um, and in essence, what they do, they have the broadcast rights, but they might also have the production rights, which they do. Mm. So they produce this content. And 
in so doing, they are able to um, contract freelancers and have them on a broadcast. So at any point, so um, South Africa play against um, India. Yeah. And we'll have Sunny Gavaskar, yeah. who's yeah. here, and Ravi Shastri, who's here, or Rahul Dravid, who's here, along with, uh, say, myself. Yeah. And, uh, a- Aisman, a- something Aisman like that, yeah. And, uh, Jackman in the past, Vessels, uh, Makai Antini, Graham Smith, Sean Pollock, Robin Peterson, whoever, all these guys, right? And Supersport will decide on what their team is that's going to call mm. um, this series. And they also then provide what is a world feed. So if you're not in South Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa and say you are in India yeah. and you're watching, somebody else has the rights there to show the cricket. They'll do their kind of build up and whatever around it. And they'll take the commentary from the production. Ah, I see how and so, it works. Yeah, yeah. So if you're watching cricket that's coming from England, you'll see Sky's commentary generally. And you'll see all their commentators plus whoever they've decided to bring in to kind of try and balance the broadcast. The Aussies didn't used to balance the broadcast. Mm, mm. They kind of just have their own blokes and kind of do that. That's why um, Supersport started sending people there to say, okay, we'll do a parallel broadcast yeah. and send it back to our folks here um, so that they can... The unbiased, they called it, which I thought current. was unfair to the Aussies because they're very fair, the Aussie <coughs> commentators, I think. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean... Bias exists always. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. no matter how you want to look at that, you know, yeah. bias always exists. And I think it was a case of Australia winning all the time in a certain period yeah, yeah. makes it sound like you're just barricading for the Australians. But yeah, it's very difficult to start talking about the guys who are on the losing side without kind of being disparaging. So yes. you tend to shift to the guys who are winning. And that's what the Aussies kind of do. How do you balance the fun element, the personality with the cricket? Because in the old days, it was very much the Mm. cricket sort of thing, you know, with the likes of Charles Fortune, with a little bit of of, of his own sort of uh, humour involved. Now, with the Shane Warnes and so on, you get quite a bit of... How do you reach that balance of of entertainment and personality with cricket acknowledged? Because that surely is the key. Yeah, I, I... It was at the start. It was hard to figure out mm. how the job goes or how it's supposed to be done. Nobody, did, they, did they sit you down, or did you make it up as you went you. along? Nobody teaches you. Wow, it's that's the most incredible thing. Yeah. No, nobody says this is how to do it. Um, you get tips from guys along the way. Um, I mean, going back to 2003 World Cup, I remember Zimbabwe playing against Australia. And in the commentary booth, and remember, I'm just mm. starting as mm. the first like proper gig that I get, yeah. and and I'm going to be paid for this. And the others were all just kind of voluntary. Yeah. You turn up and you kind of help out and whatever. And so I'm being paid to do something, which in my head I'm going, okay, I've got to do this properly. Yeah, you're a professional. Yeah, yeah. but what is properly? And in the commentary booth are, um, Mikey Holding, who I work yeah. with now, but at the time he's a hero of mine, so it's kind of a bit difficult. Tony Gregg, um, Richie Benno. Oh my goodness! Same same commentary booth, right? And I'm going, goodness gracious, what did I do? <laughs> and I remember, I remember, I think I had two stints with Richie Benno, and I sat and kind of thought, I no, I'm not allowed to talk here. I mean, great man sitting alongside yeah, me. Yeah. Never mind great man commentary. There's leg spinner and captain of, course, of Australia. Legend, and, you know, yeah. All rounder. Kind of, you know, and he's telling everyone about, about the game. What are you, pipsqueak, doing? Kind of mouthing off every five seconds. Just shut up and listen. So I sat there. And then kind of, as and I remember it so well because I just sat there and thought, oh, you know, I'm not here competing with this guy. I'm just kind of here to give my point of view. Yeah. And it, it was compliment so, to yeah, compliment. Yeah. yeah. But it was so stark in my head that I have to bring me here and not be like anybody else. Because if I am going to be like anybody else, then I might as well not be there. And if I'm going to try and be like anybody else, it just kind of defeats the purpose. I'm here because of how I am, you know, and it brings kind of a diversity to things. So it was a bit of a lesson. I didn't say too much, I must be honest. I didn't say too much in first or second stint. 
and I still kind of you know, sweating and kind of shivering, thinking, uh, uh, am I allowed to speak yet? Uh, 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 uh. That's a good shot, yeah. Was he generous? Did he bring you in? Yeah, very, yeah. very generous. You know, in yeah. 50 years of commentating, he never called Australia we. Yeah, I mean... Because he took, he took uh, uh, objective, unbiased commentary very seriously, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I mean, so... Yeah. People will say, and it, I guess it, it happens over periods of time where, you know, a guy will commandeer a space. A yeah. bit like you, you commandeer the, the radio space. In the morning, yeah. people turn on the radio and they listen to John as they drive along. And it then becomes how to do it is how he did it because that's how old people know, right? And it's kind of difficult to grapple with that mm. in your mind and be in the same space, but you do it differently. However... There is no right way because if there was a right way, they'd tell you. Yes. Right? Yes, they'd say, yes. come in here. This is how we do it. We turn left. We go right. We go up. We go down. <laughs> Nobody says that. So if people like what you do, such is life. If people so don't So it's like, sink or swim, really. Correct. You get in there and if you have it. You have it. If yeah. you don't, hey, find something else. <laughs> what about personalities? I mean, for example, I mean... Uh, um, Ian Chappell and, and Ian Botham famously yeah. <laughs> don't <laughs> like each other. How does that work? Still, they still don't. Really? And this goes back to when Ian Botham wanted to smack, chase him down a street in Melbourne or something, wasn't it? So I, I, don't, I don't know the actual story. And, I, and mm. the reason I say I don't know it is because I've heard both of them yeah, tell, a, tell, different a, events, tell a story. Yeah. And they speak about different events, yeah. you know. And essentially it comes up to one challenging the other to say kind of pick on someone your own size yeah. sort of thing you know the story i've heard was yeah. chapel was anti-english anti-english and both of them took exception as a young cricketer and at one stage almost came to fists and yeah. they've never buried the hatchet they never have i mean I, I, I don't know how many years ago now maybe four or five years ago apparently they were in a car park ag uh, mm. again and kind of going at each other and had to be separated and, now in in their 60s <laughs> yeah. like that's ridiculous isn't it yeah. but that's and does anyone chat does anyone raise that or is that something you wouldn't raise because you know it's a sensitive issue you would raise it oh so so to both of them um you can you'd never be in the company of both together yeah, yeah. ever right but you'd be in the company of each separately yeah and you can bring it up it's not it's not like it's a taboo or then they'll happily talk about it They'll happily say, oh, he's a so-and-so. And, -so, and, yeah, and the yeah, other one will say, yeah, well, he's a so-and-so. Yeah. -so. And it's fascinating because you'd think great cricketers, you know, and kind of how seen life, old people, right? Wisdom, gray hairs, <laughs> all of that, right? You'd think... <laughs> to, air, to air is human, to forgive divine. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. But, but you would think that, you know, you don't need this, you know? It, Bury the hatchet. Like, just forget about it. You would think that would be the case, but I guess they're human. <laughs> and, and Michael Holding and uh, T20 cricket. That's, uh, is that's, it true that his contract says he's not allowed to speak about it because he hates it so much? So he, he being Mikey Holding, you can put things in your own contract, right? Yeah, I was so, okay, yeah, right. so, so he, he says, I remember when he turned up here to do, so three or four years ago, he turned up and he's kind of been regular uh, with Supersport. Because yeah, he's well, my idol. I think yeah, he's just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic voice, right? Yeah. Like uh, awesome. To, you can just listen to him and listen yeah. to him. <laughs> you know, even when he's just regaling us with stories about times past. You know? So he turns up the first time and we're... Um, and I think what happened was there were 2020s in the middle of one day as 2020s and tests yeah. or something like that. And, then, and so he said, oh, by the way, next week I'm going wherever in his Jamaican lilt. I want to go to a game park or yeah. whatever. Horse racing. <laughs> yeah, like, correct. Yeah. You know, so, so then he said, so, so I said, well, the, the 2020s coming up, you know, you're still on tour. You can't just like go on holiday. I only do cricket. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you have to say any more. So, going back to your career, I mean, everyone says you were a magnificent bowler. You weren't quick enough. Why is it a big slab of meat like you because you look like a West Indian bowler from the from the the seventies. Why couldn't you bowl quicker? What, what what makes a really fast bowler? I guess fast switch fibers. Um, yeah. So genetics. Yeah, partly. Gen genetics partly. Um, I think efficiency of action. Yeah. Um, I at some point I injured my back, so I ah. I didn't used to bowl very fast anyway. I used to be sort of 
uh, kind of medium fast, so mm. mid 130s or whatever, and then injured my back and kind of had to try and shift actions. And I, I don't think I could ever get it. Like I mm. don't think I could ever get the slight difference in action. And so timing kind of didn't work. So no matter how much strength I tried to build up and try and get to bowl it quicker, sometimes I'd manage it at nets and all the rest. Yeah. But I'd almost revert when I got when I got to the, the actual game, when you got, got to the middle. And it was a source of frustration. But in the end, just sort of thought, no, well, this is your lot, you know. You can work with what you have and, and, and see how you go. And that's, that's just it. Just give see, it a go. I, with what I, you I find it fascinating because obviously to see the really quick bowlers is, I mean, that is perhaps the most mm. magnificent thing in cricket. And then you get a Vernon Philander. Yeah. All right. Who is one of the deadliest bowlers in the world. And he bowls military medium. Yeah. You know, what, what is your advice to a young fast bowler listening to this? Say, say a guy, 13 years of age, who looks like he's going to have the physique and is the fastest in his school. What's your advice? I, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd advise those who kind of coach and teach him. I mean, you, you do what you want. You, you run and you bowl as fast as you can. That's, if that's what mm. kind of floats your boat, that's what you do. Um, and as you go along, you learn skills you learn to swing it you learn to kind of nip it back mm. you 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 learn slower balls and what to do when batsmen do certain things and you kind of learn nuances and to go to Vernon Philander he bowls not as fast as Kakiso Rabada or Dale no, Stein yeah. or you know in or Ney mm. any of the fast guys but he bowls with the same mindset so he is as aggressive and as attacking as Dale Steyn, mm. despite it being at medium pace. And he knows exactly what he's doing with the ball. And so that, that kind so of... So would you say know your limitations and maximize them? Would that sum it up? Yeah, I mean, you have to know. Your, you learn them as you go yeah. along. But you, I think try to break your limits. You know, try anything. You know, mm. you, you, you've got to give it a go. You, in essence... For me, when I sort of turned up and found how difficult things were, the one thing that's in my head that always was in my head was back yourself. Mm. You, can, you can. I know I can. And if I can't do it the way he does it, I'm going to do it a different way. And you find that way, whatever that way is. And you, you go at it. It doesn't matter if you fail, fail today. You can look at the you know, middle of... Tendulkar's bat or Kallis's mm, bat mm. for 200 runs, but you've still got to believe you're going to find its edge. Well, you right? got drafted out twice the wall, didn't you, in a, in, in a, in a match. Tell us about that. Talk oh, us through them. Talk us through oh, them. Oh, well, you're probably talking about the test match in Harare. Yeah. Where, where it, was, it was an interesting test match, actually. And Gavin Rennie, who I was talking about yeah. earlier, he got hit on the head yeah. by Javagal Srinath. Uh, good bowler. Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good bowler. And, and at, at Harare Sports Club, it just used to stand up a little yeah. bit because it was tennis ball bounce. And, were going nicely and he was batting nicely on 40 odd or whatever and um, probably 90 for one something like that and he, towards the end of the day bang hits on the head down and a game we were kind of we, we had we were going well kind of shifted and instead of putting a score on the board that was going to be kind of 280 yeah. 290 that you know would be difficult to chase we ended up putting up 240 odd and I remember Dave Houghton saying to us you bowlers, you're going to win this game, right? And yeah, Dave was coached by then. And um, Streak, Olonga, yeah. myself, I remember Adam Huckle playing, leg spinner. Yeah. Um, and I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember if Brian Strang was in, in the side or, or if he wasn't. But as a collective, it just seemed, seemed to click. And I remember that I didn't bowl for some time um, and then was brought into the attack yeah. for the second time around. And I ran up, I think it had a catch dropped and I got upset. <laughs> As <laughs> Which, one does. As one does. But, <laughs> but it, it kind of wasn't, um, not the upset yeah, sort of blow, yeah. you know. And I, and I got upset, had a bit of a shout at someone and then came on again and oh, decent enough spell. And knocked him over again. I think it was LBW the second time yeah, around, yeah. and 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 it kind of just oh, I don't know. I exploded, and I shouted and swearing at everybody. And oh, what's going on? What's going on with this kid? What's going on with you? And everyone comes together and say, "We have to win. 
you know, we have to win this one, you know? And yeah, it, it, it was fascinating. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not the wicket I, I remember, but more the experience of that whole test and how things kind of yes, unfolded yes, yes. And, the, and the part that you play in the first innings. Um, I think there's also some partnership. And when I came on, um, I used to try and swing the ball away. And it's quite funny how it works. It's, you'd think you're an away swinging ball, yeah. but sometimes the ball just goes the other way. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so I kept running up trying to swing this away. And they kind of playing that way and poof, went back and bang. I think it was LBW again, all yeah. caught, caught behind us on an inside edge. And I, oh, wow, fascinating. It's, it's brilliant. And the whole game, as we sit here, kind of just plays out. And there are little moments that pop up. And it's the couple of wickets. I think Anguli might have been the other one I, I, I got yeah, out yeah. Um, on that in that game, the second innings. And it just rolled on. They couldn't get to 247, I think it was, and bowled them out. And fascinating. What, 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 what led to the golden age of, of Zimbabwean cricket? I mean, when you were really competitive, you sort of came in at the end of it, didn't you? Yeah, so, you, I mean, I played with guys... Um, I mean, the Flower Brothers. Who did, who did well. So, know, yeah, Brander, Streak, I mean... Yeah, so so Brandes kind of at the end of his career. I remember him, him bowling England out, you know, getting yeah. a hat trick against England, and then Chicken Farmer David Lloyd, who now I work with, yeah, you know, I was yeah. commentator, and we often chuckle about it. Actually, yeah. we murdered him. He said, "Right, <laughs> <laughs> that was in the first Test match." And anyway, the the one day series of that, and yeah, Brandes was sort of coming towards the end, and, mm. and you know, the guys who who had played for a long time and Zim didn't have Test status, kind of didn't get a a big opportunity and even then it wasn't fully professional mm. so it was quite difficult and so the thing that leads to, to Zim doing decently is that guys go from having jobs and coming to practice in chicken in, farm yeah, yeah in the afternoon to many of the guys just playing cricket and being able to play quite a lot getting a first class structure that kind of worked yeah. even though there were quite a few guys and being able to kind of go on tour and it just kind of comes together at the right time. Unfortunately, it kind of unravels as well, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was fascinating playing in that time because um, it, it seemed weird. Like it's all it's it's what you wanted to do, yeah. But it seemed a little bit weird in in that. Oh, gee, can I just can I really just like play cricket and do nothing else? Yeah. Is, yeah. is, this, is this my job? My dad used to ask me all the time. I said. You, when are you going to get a real job? Yeah, you, you, you need to get a job. <laughs> no, no, I don't. This is my job. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. You need a real job. And, and Zimbabwe, it's, I mean, Henry Alonga spoke out. And, yes. And I think the Flower Brothers spoke out at some time. And, and we know from South Africa how lunacy yeah. in politics can, can put a country in risk. What was it like, despite the unbelievable atmosphere in 1980 of Zimbabwe I know a lot of bad stuff was hidden because of the euphoria mm. when you watched it unravel and you are a sporting icon or a sporting personality was the temptation to get involved to speak or was it a question of keep your head down and just do what you're doing it's a tough question but looking, yeah, looking so, back yeah, could, so, could you have done more could so, you also put your hand up yeah I think so, when you look back so when I look back I, I probably could have done more but mm. Um, when I look back at um, at the way I was, so at twenty, I was probably very naive. Yeah, um, I was a uh, so politically, um, just kind of socially, you'd probably say mm. I was. You know, cricket was it. it. It didn't matter what else was happening, and I um, I just look to play cricket and be mm. the best cricketer I I could be. Too much so, probably. Um, and the things that were around you, not that they didn't matter, but they essentially kind of were none of your business, you know, things mm. were separated. So when, when in 2003, um, Olonga and um, Andy Flower decided they were going to do this, they even kind of kept it secret from the team. Right. So remember that in 2003, I wasn't in the squad. So I was around in practice squad, mm. practicing, doing everything, but I was going to be on the commentary team. So I remember finishing a practice session in Bulawayo um, and Henry saying, we're well, sitting, there's just the two of us in the change room, in the Queen Sports Club change room in Bulawayo and said, um, uh, I'm going to do something. I can't tell you about it because mm. if I tell you about it, then you're kind of in, in with me. And I don't want other people yeah, to be tarred with the same brush. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't want you to be in it because mm. uh, 
you you might not think the same way as me or you, and I said you're talking gibberish what are you talking about yeah. and I didn't know what he was talking yeah, about at yeah, the time yeah, so yeah. so and he's like um yeah don't worry about it I'm just telling you but I'm going to do something when what how blah 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 it was end of the training squad finished everybody went off and it must have been about four or five days later back up in Harare first game of the World Cup against Namibia there they were standing outside on the balcony with their armbands on yeah kind of like, oh okay so so that's it then the statement went out and it was read and so forth and it was and it was a big deal I mean what do you how do you think how do you feel about what they did um I think it was gutsy yeah having lived um in the country at that time and understanding how things go whoa, hats off i mean hats mm. off because i don't know and you kind of you, it's a difficult one because you don't know after the event you can say oh yeah, yeah i could have done that right yeah. but before it's done it's almost impossible like you, if i sit and i say okay i'm gonna do x and come out and speak up against government or yeah. against blah 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 a dictatorship yeah basically. you know yeah. so i no ways no 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 mm. i i no nah, I, i wouldn't say I, i would have been able to do it i was not that as i say i was naive i was not that way inclined i just say hats off to them they they kind of had the courage of their convictions to to say what they felt and to try and shift things from whatever they were to something else or are you optimistic about zimbabwe now i always am Yeah. I always have no, but I always am right. I'm always yeah. optimistic yeah. as well. But yeah. given the change, given one of the old guard has come in and has talked good, but has kept many of the old guard there. I mean, obviously, he has to balance political. Uh, but are, are you, um, uh, can we see Zimbabwe becoming the country it should be? Yeah, I, I it's think got everything. Yeah, I think so, John. I, I just, I suppose it's, it's age that kind of does yeah. this. Uh, I, I think many things take a really long time and what a long time is it's kind of indefinable you know you you can't say a long time is 10 years you can't yeah. say a long time is one year and so many things have to happen in order for the path to kind of lead to wherever it is and even when it's led to wherever there are yeah. still things that must happen so but leadership is the key the yeah. leaders nelson mandela the clerk were the people who you know there's got to be that leadership there that is that that, that takes people with them yeah 100% but but even then i mean so kind of juxtapose south africa and zimbabwe and say yeah. if you try and draw a line and sort of a trajectory to kind of where countries are going um i'd say you know zimbabwe can only go up Mm. right it, it can't go anywhere else right and and if it went down goodness where would it be going yeah you know yeah, and yeah. so so with things that happen you you hope and you kind of just think well clearly this must happen and you know this doesn't need to happen but it, it will and as you go along this will change that will change and yeah i i i'm hopeful that it doesn't take a really really long time but it takes time all of it does and little by little process by process it will kind of come right i mean let's let, let let's hope so and cricket test cricket future <laughs> for zimbabwe or just generally no, just in general in, in general I, i i'm a test cricket nut by the way i, I hate t20 <laughs> oh, i can just about watch odi but to sit for five days and watch test cricket i'm in absolute heaven and yet many people say in 10 years it'll be gone no chance uh, i think that test match it will always be there mm. i genuinely think that it it is fascinating it is you can't so you can't have what happens in test match cricket happen in a 2020 yeah. game exactly or a um one day international 50 over game you can't have it happen you can't and you can't explain it to someone just how stuff unfolds how things change from day to day yeah, so full contact chess so, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Just, exactly yeah. like you know it just so the game shifts so you i was talking to someone yesterday who was saying oh pakistan are turning up how good are they going to be or how, you know it should be a good series and i said look being realistic be okay there'll be good enough battles but yeah. south africa should win and 
Um, Pakistan don't travel well to South Africa. They just don't. It's too difficult for them. And he said, oh, so what do you mean? Like three-day tests and, and stuff like that. He said, the length of the test doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot. Yes, mm-hmm. it can be one-sided in three days, but it can be one-sided in four and a half days. You yes, know, so, yes. so there are lots of things that happen. There'll be good things to pick but up But how do you Pakistan. tell that to the next generation who are watching oh. their big bash and big... Now there's T10 cricket. <laughs> you know, how do you say you sit and watch for five days and without being a cliche in, in, in these days of instant gratification? I think you've got to feel things, John. I think yeah. that's, that's how it works. So I always say cricket is a, is a bug. Uh, my kids play now and I... I I think when people coach little kids, you hope that the bug bites. And if it does, even if they don't play it forever, if the bug bites and they get an understanding of the enjoyment of what happens and how it unfolds, it never leaves them. Yeah. You, you don't sort of one day love cricket and then kind of, I don't and, love and it course, anymore. But that brings you to the back to commentary. Because 100%. you, in a way, are responsible for, for giving that bug, aren't you? Oh, I tell you what, it's... As I said, it's like living the dream, yeah. but I'm under no illusion about the responsibility you have as the one who kind of has to talk about whatever it is. So yeah. this great game, I mean, has been for ages and you don't want to be the one who drives people away from it. Absolutely. What's, so, the, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you in commentary? Uh, I don't know. Because uh, there must be funny things. Oh, oh no, <laughs> funny things. No, that's off guard. I don't know. Uh, All right, well, I'll tell you what. The next mm. time we get you in, because there's a lot more I'll, to I'll, talk about. Oh, think you about can, it. You, yeah. you, you can think about it. Uh, Pommy, thanks for chatting to us. Thanks for the fabulous job that you that you do and, and everything of the best going forward. Yeah, thanks, John. And yeah, good luck with the next nine. What a fascinating chat. Gee, time went quickly and we'll get Pommy back in again at some stage because there's a lot more to talk about. Thanks as usual to Slow in the City for hosting us. Follow us on social media or subscribe via your favorite podcast app for updates. See you next time on the Sport Exchange Podcast. Cheers from John Robbie.